Alex, and welcome to another episode of At Home with the Word. I'm Mr. Fitz Houston, and as always, we have a great lesson lined up for you today. Now, of course, my title is kind of comical. Uh, God, why did you do that? Now, comical topic, but serious subject, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. First, give me a prayer, Father God. Thank you so much for this show, Lord. And thank you for everyone who took the time to stop right now to, to watch this lesson. For we know it's no accident they turn to this lesson at this appointed time that they may be able to hear the word going forth, comprehend it, and be able to apply it immediately to their lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Now this topic, just as a few of my other topics, was born out of many of you writing in my comment section about different issues of the, of the times. We know what's going on in, in the world right now with man changing God's law. But let's go beyond that subject. Let's just look at the world in general, the times in general, all the violence in the world. Uh, you, you always hear people say, well, why do bad things happen to good people? Well, if God was such a God, how come he let this, these people die or those people die? Why is God punishing? You know, we get all these anger responses at God. But we really need to take a step back because we're looking at everything from our own limited personal perspective. If you understand what I'm saying. It's like we only know so much of the big plan and as a matter of fact let me read my text first because my text actually my text is actually based on uh, understanding that issue because if you understand the text of where I'm coming from then you'll understand exactly why I called it this subject God why did you do that now, the text comes from Isaiah 55 8 and 9 for my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor my ways, nor your ways, my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Now, that those two scriptures there right there by themselves tell us there's a bigger picture than what we see. His ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. But when we're reacting to something, we're reacting to our thoughts because we see what's happening in a limited point of view, which is our point of view, when God is looking at the big picture. I always look, I like to use a parable. Think of life as a chess game. And we're simply pawns on the chess game. So we're in charge of our little square and whether we go forward or take a, take another pawn going diagonal for those who know chess <laughs> chess but but it's very simple that's 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 our world that's our our square and which way we're going to be moved we have no idea what's going on in the game itself the big picture is what's happening on the board we're only seeing our square and the squares around us whether we're taking or not now let's take that parable and apply it to life. And um, the first half of this lesson, I guarantee you right now, I'll, I'll actually put most of the scriptures in the description box because I'm giving you a lot of scriptures that are supporting this immensity of, of, of a, a gap between our knowledge and God's knowledge. Um, let's look at, um, let's turn, turn first to um, Daniel 2.21. Now Daniel 2.21 says, He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and secret things. So that's why when the Lord says He's a re rewarder to those who diligently seek Him. If you're not seeking to find the deeper answers in God, He's not going to reveal to you something that you don't have the comprehension to understand. Matter of fact, when Jesus was about to be crucified and after he had told the disciples about you know how he had to leave and but he you know and he had a mission to fulfill and they were so upset that he had to leave they went in a grieving mode before the crucifixion he couldn't even get to the point 
to tell them the why because their mind was locked on the fact that he had to go through this mission, he was going to die. And we, he, they didn't even get to ask the question of the mission itself. And he actually said, well, I'm paraphrasing, uh, I would tell you more if I thought you could understand it. So right there is Jesus himself saying, I, I, I can only tell you what I think you will comprehend because your comprehension, I could tell you and you wouldn't understand. And that's basically what... What this scripture in Daniel just said is that, uh, uh, like again, he reveals deep and secret things to those who have understanding. And understanding comes by what? Studying the word and searching for the truths. Even if you're going to seminary school, Bible college, there's still more to learn. So, in essence, you can never stop learning about God because every time you study more, he reveals more. Study more reveals more. The higher up the ladder you go, the more he reveals based on your understanding. And some of you have seen some comments. I'll tell you right now, some of you have some questions for me. You should be in Bible college because Bible college and seminary school deal with the, the deeper issues. And if you're asking me some deep questions on the YouTube comment line, I said, that person is really seeking some serious truth. Some people are just trying to seek how to get through their day with the word or how do I pray more. But when you're asking me deep questions about God, that's a mindset that is now ready to absorb the deeper mysteries God has to offer. Let's go some more more scriptures. Um, Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 29, 29. The secret things belong to God. But those things which are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that they may do all the words of this law. Now, that's basically saying the things we do understand about the word. Those of us who are studying the word and are saved and we go to Bible study and we go to uh, fellowship and, and, and we're constantly studying the word as everyday laymen. The things we learn is what we should be teaching our children and passes the word down. That's why I'm always saying the unfortunate thing about hate is those hate groups who want to hold on to hate keep teaching the next generation hate and guess what? Hate's going to continue. If everybody would just teach love, hate would be long gone by now. But those that want to hold on to the old times of hating the different races because you don't understand, because they're different, different color, all that mess, that's just the devil using that to keep keep hate alive. That's what we want to keep love, keep love alive. The devil's working on keeping hate alive, and that's what really that's all about. Um, so, And then in Jeremiah 33, 3, one of my favorites, he says, Call to me, and I will answer you, and tell you great and mighty things which you do not know. Again, when you're calling to the Lord, you must be seeking more information, uh, understanding that you don't really understand. So that's why you're calling to Him. And once He says, when you call to Him, I will answer you and tell you great mighty things which you don't know. So, so the secrets and mysteries we always hear in the Bible, they aren't something like the CIA where you got to crack a safe, break through the wall, or set a bomb <laughs> to get to the information. The information is revealed to you when he's convinced that you will understand and he's observing that you're diligently searching the word, you're searching, you're searching for answers, you even in your prayer time, Lord, just just reveal to me this this question. I don't understand this, don't understand that. Now and the, and that's really the key to to understanding what I'm saying this whole thing is why did God do that now let me go over some of the other scriptures I want to share with you as far as bringing out the differences in uh, our intellects um, something is Ecclesiastes 724 what has been is what has been is remote and exceedingly mysterious who can discover it Romans 8 33 on the depth of the riches both of wisdom and knowledge, the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable are his ways. Let me say it again. On the depth and riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable 
are his judgments and unfathomable his ways. I mean, you can't even figure you can't even figure his ways out. And so, again, like I said, when we get into questioning why he did this or that, we don't know the big picture. Um, Psalms one forty five three, great is the Lord and highly to be praised. His greatness is unsearchable. Psalm seventy seven nineteen, your way was in the sea and your paths in the mighty waters and your footprints may not be known unknown the unknown movements of god 11 30 uh matthew 11 27 now this is jesus talking all things have been handed over to me by the father and no one knows the son except the father nor does anyone know the father except the son and anyone to whom the Son reveals to him the Father. So that's why Jesus is our mediator to God the Father. And that's why when he came here to show us how to live on earth victoriously, when we pray through Jesus Christ, then he's telling God what our prayer requests are. And that's how the Trinity works. Holy Spirit in us. Jesus is the mediator between us and God the Father. So that's how they work together. Uh, 1 Corinthians 2.10 for to us God revealed to them through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. Now, the Holy Spirit, when Jesus said, I had to leave and leave the Comforter, the Comforter, Holy Spirit, is helping us to understand those secrets. But still, it still starts with you looking for the secrets. See, look at the Holy Spirit as being the spiritual translator who lives inside you but he's not going to translate until you're searching for something for him to translate if you're not searching about any truths about God he's not going to say a word about it but now if you really just walk in the, the floor at night trying to understand God I'm trying to understand this concept I don't understand what's going on I don't understand what's going on then that's when you go like well I just need some help you just say it in prayer just reveal this to me. Reveal to me what am I missing? What am I missing? And he will reveal it to you. And that's that's the way God works in terms of the bits of nuggets of knowledge he reveals to you is through the Holy Spirit. Um, move on. Let's see. Look at it. Now, there are several in Job I'd like to share with you. Because remember now, Job, of all things, of all people, <laughs> his hard times was actually a test but also to prove a point. Now, of course, and those who know the Job story, I'll paraphrase quickly. Job was such a strong man of God. The devil, you know, God asked the devil, what are you doing? I'm walking to and fro, seeking who I may destroy. You know, you know, that's what the devil does. He seeks who he may destroy. If you're not studying the word, he's going to seek to destroy you quicker than those who study the word. So God starts bragging about Job. Well, consider my servant Job. And good, devil goes, yeah, you're right. Yeah, it's Job. Yeah, I'm going to... I'm going to attack Job. You're going to do nothing to protect him because he's your boy. <laughs> and of course, God said, okay, you know what? I'll make a deal with you. I'll let you throw, I'll let you throw everything at Job except you can't kill him. You can throw every hardship you want to throw him and I bet you he will never curse me. Devil goes, oh, really? I can throw the book at him. Just don't kill him. And you think he's not going to curse you when I get through with him? It's a deal. So that's what the whole whole book of Job is about. That attack that was actually a test and came through victorious. Now, of course, he, his wife criticized him, his kids, friends, everybody thought he was crazy. Job got upset. Job fussed at God. Uh, he couldn't understand why things were happening, but he never cursed God. And that was what the whole challenge was. The devil thought he was going to make things so hard that he was going to eventually just give up and, and just renounce God and just curse him. But he never did that. And the way it, it ended, he was rewarded triple fold what he, what he lost during the test itself. So that's what the big picture was there. He had no idea why he was going through all that stuff when he was going through it. Matter of fact, most of his questions were, God, why are you doing this? Why are you doing that? I'm, I'm a man of God. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. How come? Well, I don't understand. He doesn't understand. Why is God doing it? And in his case, God was doing it because it was a bigger picture was God proving a point to the devil, spiritual warfare, 
proving ground. But Joel had no idea what that was in his spirit. He was just going through hard times and asking God, why did you do that? And then when he was victorious and all of a sudden the blessings came back, even though he didn't even know why God did that, he all he knew were the blessings came back and his life was now way better than it was even before the test. But his answer to why did God do that was really never known to Job, other than the fact that it was over and the blessings are back. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. And see, that's the limit of what we will know about the big picture. That's why this lesson, if you remember nothing else, and this is how the how the uh, Holy Spirit revealed to me, because I used to get upset like you. I've seen violence. I've seen this. People bombing churches, burning churches, innocent people getting shot. I'm going, well, God, I mean, God is a God of love. What's going on? Because, see, I'm looking at my picture. I'll give a perfect example. Let's just take three icons. Dr. Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, President John F. Kennedy. There are others that were assassinated. But let's just say those assassinations did not take place. Where would our country be if none of them were assassinated? Think about it. Now, when you look at each one of the assassinations, it brought the country together in some way that needed healing, unity, uh, people correcting a mistake that was constantly there until the event happened. But in these particular cases, as sad as we were about the actual assassination, the movement that followed was actually probably twice as effective and twice as fast as it would have been if they were not assassinated. Now, of course, this is an editorial point here because this is how the, God, uh, the Holy Spirit kind of revealed to me about just disasters, about, about when the, uh, is the devil taking good people away. But see, we really don't know because this, this whole theory, and there's a whole different Bible study I'll do about death itself, but in the whole scenario of assassinations and, and all the different things that happen to good people, why, why are they taken out? In the big picture, remember, all of our days are numbered. It says it in, in Psalms. All the, and he knew every one of our days before we lived even one of them. We don't know for a fact that our days on this earth may be 31 years. And be and and remember, he knows all of our days before we live them. So your 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 time on this earth is thirty one years, and you're gonna do this, this is, and this is gonna happen, and because you know, you're gonna be a major effect on the world because of this event. Well, see, that's that's the chessboard. We have no idea what somebody's assassination is gonna lead to. Just like the the nut that shot up the church over in the Carolina, and said he's trying to cause a race war and for those who saw the funeral the funeral brought both races together in such a way that was a a show of unity that never would have happened at that point if that kid had not done those shootings now of course people say well those but those 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 nine people were innocent now of course here we go we get into our editorial you know, there's a phrase you always hear, the movies use it all the time, the needs of the many outweigh the needs of a few. Now, what does that mean? And let's, let's just use that shooting as, as an example. As sad as we are about nine innocent people being shot, if their purpose in the big picture was to bring unity to that area, see, they're, they're going to be with the Lord anyway because remember be when you're a follower of Christ to be <laughs> absent of the body is to be with Christ they're rewarded in heaven immediately as soon as they were shot they were they were with God but in far as on earth our limited view is so upset about why did God do that if God's bigger picture is to bring people together because I mean see in his eyes remember we die from our bodies but our spirit doesn't die so in God's eyes we're just changing forms we're changing from well, we're not changing form because our, our spirit is in our body so you just 
living in a different medium now because once you die the body of course is dead but the spirit lives forever either with God or in hell depending on what you did in your life and what decision you make and that's how it continues on so the the holy the holy whole purpose of this Bible study is to get you to understand when you see things happen in the world it's the bigger picture that is the reason for whatever happened happened and usually when you watch history and you watch a few days later or down the line you go like oh, okay if this hadn't happened that would have happened I mean um, you know uh, some of the major cancer foundations were formed because a person's daughter or son died at such an early age which is really sad and they're asking well, God why are you taking my daughter but she's only three years old why'd you kill my daughter but if the daughter's death leads to the creation of a foundation to raise money to fight cancer for decades to come she didn't die in vain she died because in the big picture we needed to get something movement to start a foundation see if if, if you look at things like that you'll see in every instance of somebody's death no nobody dies a meaningless death we title it that so drive-by shootings you know a drive-by shootings and somebody in, in the wrong place at the wrong time increases all of a sudden the, 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 the gang task force triples inside only because of that death or all of a sudden they they put up security or they put up this or that they're countless countless things it, it, it makes you frustrated in the flesh because you're going why do we have to wait for somebody to die for people to put this law in motion because we're thinking if your mind is saying this is dangerous here we need security or that's a floodgate there the floodgate needs to be higher to avoid major hurricanes but have to wait till the entire city floods before you make the higher floodgate see those things frustrate me to no end as far as my flesh is concerned but again what did the disaster lead to that God made for good? See, no matter what the devil tries to do, he, he, he tries to take a disaster and kill your belief in God, make you angry at God, make you doubt God, make you so negative that you'll just give up on God. See, see, when the event happens, the devil goes to work on your mind to make you as negative as possible in viewing that disaster, to think, what kind of God are you serving if he does this, he does that, he does this? That's what the devil does. His whole job is to get you to doubt, give up, or curse God. And that's the first thing he's going to plant in your mind when you see a disaster or of any kind of disaster. Murder, shooting on the street, violence, I mean, all, all that. That's, that's his, remember he's still the God of this world. So he's throwing, he stepped it up a notch now. He's shooting people in churches, you burning churches. He, he's no longer caring about being careful where he goes to do his dirt and his violence and his shooting. If he's burning churches like in the, in the earlier part of uh, the 20th century, and, and now he's doing it in modern day times, he's trying to bring back the hatred of the old days and reignite it. But people's mindsets are in a different place now. More people are holding on to God's promises. More people, the, the, the psyche and consciousness is in a different place. And that's why holding on to the word and promises of God keeps you balanced because as you're now seeing all this stuff around you, you're thinking Psalms, 90, Psalms 91, 23rd Psalms, any of the soothing th uh, Psalms and scriptures that keep you at peace because when you're saying, I cast all my care on you, Lord, for you care for me, I know that when I give it to you, you care for me. I can do all things to Christ who strengthens me. I can do all things through Christ. My God shall supply all my need, whatever I need, through His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. So those are three of the promises. But what I'm saying is all the promises of God are based on the big picture. Not the little picture. We're saying the, the scripture uh, based on all, a uh, perfect example. I'm saying, God shall supply all my need according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus, Philippians 4.19. Now, if... If I say that scripture from a personal point of view, then all my need is what I can immediately think of right now. But when I'm looking at it from God's point of view, God shall supply all my need. 
best need of the future now, needs we don't even know we have, needs we don't even know that are coming, we've just put completely in his hands. God shall supply all my need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. That means whenever a need comes, we've just said, I know God's going to take care of it. We've put it in his hands. We put the problem in God's hands, especially with that promise. When we give it up to the Lord. We're giving every need up to the Lord, whether we see it or not, or even have experienced it or not. And that's what giving it up to the Lord means. Give your problem to the Lord. If you're feeling fearful, anxiety, doubt, you have not given it to the Lord. You're still trying to figure it out with your limited mind. And because it's limited, you don't see any answers. You don't see any doors open. You don't see any solutions. You don't know, how's God going to do that? Because He knows how He's going to do it. Once you give it up to Him, cast your cares to Him, because He cares for you, He was ready to take it over. But you're busy running around like a chicken with his head cut off, trying to find an answer that you can't see from your limited knowledge but once you give it to him he's probably got 10 to 15 20 solutions to your one problem but you can only see one and guess what it ain't working <laughs> so that's why we give it up to the lord and say you know what i, I don't see I, I see no doors i see no light at the end of the tunnel i i get no here no there but you know what I cast all my care on God because He cares for me. My God is going to supply all my need according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. I'm not Second uh, Corinthians 4:18. I'm looking not at the things that are seen, but at things that are not seen. For things that are seen are temporary. Things that are seen are going to change, but things that are not seen are eternal. Which means the things that I see now, the conditions that are bad or whatever crazy, eventually they're going to be manifested in the truly positive, the opposite, the victory, the breakthrough. And, the, and that's this lesson is all about. If you understand nothing else in this lesson, know that when you cast your care on Him and you give your problem to the Lord, whatever that problem is, He's going to take care of the now part of it, the future part of it, and parts that you don't even know that are going on. And that's why, and that's the big picture. The things that we don't even know going on. He sees all that because he's looking at the whole, he, my chessboard. He's looking at the whole chessboard. We cast our care on the chessboard. We're basing it on our little square. He said, oh, well, down the line, he's going to run that. Down the line, he's going to run that. Down the line, he's going to run that. Okay, well, I'll take care of that. Take care of that. Take care of that. He's taking care of all the things you don't even know are coming. Because once you say, I cast my care on you, then everything about you is being taken care of, whether you know it or not. That's the beauty of having faith in God. That's why it says, have faith in God. And when you pray, believe you've received it, and you shall have it. When you pray, don't hope you're going to receive it. You just don't know when you're going to receive it. But when you pray, believe you have received it, and start acting like you have it. See, so if, if you're waiting for a breakthrough to come through, then even though the breakthrough hadn't happened yet, expect it. If you're expecting a financial breakthrough, make your list of what you're going to do when that breakthrough comes through. Whatever the breakthrough you're expect, expecting, perform your duties around the house and your lifestyle as if it already happened. That's putting the law of expectancy in place so that when the, the breakthrough blessing comes, you step right into it because you were expecting all along. You just don't know the when. And that's why I said earlier in other episodes, when you wait on the Lord, you just say, thank God, for my, thank you, Lord, for my breakthrough. Thank you, Lord, for my breakthrough is on the way. Thank you for my deliverance is on the way. So you keep thanking him every day for the breakthrough or the deliverance is on the way. And that keeps the devil from saying, what's taking God so long? He ain't coming through. No, every day, thank you, Lord, for my breakthrough. Oh, thank you, Lord, for my victory. Oh, thank you, Lord, for another day. My victory is getting closer. See, you've got to confess it every single day day until you see it because the day you don't confess it is the day the devil's going to throw doubt into your mind and you have to get, kind of get extra mad get out get thee behind me satan my god shall supply all my need those doubts come to your mind shout out the devil get thee behind me satan 
devil is a liar. You always see my blogs. I say devil is a liar in a minute because the doubt he throws into your mind is a lie. Because through Jesus Christ, you have victory in every situation you're dealing with. Hey, that's basically what I want to share with you. I'm going to put on the description box a whole bunch more scriptures for those who are interested and want to see all of them because they basically all say the same thing in terms of the immensity of God versus our limitedness the things we don't know even with all of our study just to let us understand that when we don't understand why God does something it's because we can't see the big picture and and just know that God is in the midst of everything that's happening and for those of us who believers and followers of Christ, then along with that belief comes his protection and him taking care of us when we cast our care on him to take care of us. So that's why we have to keep those things in motion every single day through prayer, confessions, listen to gospel music, listen to my videos, anybody's videos, empower your spirit every single day because the devil is just waiting for you to take an off day so he can throw doubt so father god we just thank you so much for this message lord and, and lord i i hope that it, it blessed many who are trying to understand where you stand in many of the violent times today and the things that seem to be happening to good people and people are, are, are not understanding lord help them to understand that in the big picture of things, you're in control of everything because you already have the victory and we already have the victory through Jesus Christ, Lord. And right now, for anybody who does not know who Jesus Christ is and you want to receive him, say this with me. Father, forgive me for the wrong I've done and the wrong I've been. I believe that Jesus died on the cross and was raised from the dead for me and my sin. And from this day forward, I will not do a single thing in life or make a single decision in life without lifting it up to you first. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And that's where you start. And that's how you get the Spirit. And then, and then when you're feeling you're doing more studying and then the Holy Spirit is ready to come in and teach you because now once you received Him, you just say the Holy Spirit... I want to learn more, Lord. Come into Holy Spirit, teach me, guide me. I want to know more. And then the Holy Spirit will step right in, move right in, start cleaning out things because all the things are ungodly. As soon as the Holy Spirit comes in, He's going to say, okay, change friends, change activities, don't do this anymore. You need to clean up your act. This is how you do it. He's going to, he's going to be teaching you these things because this isn't a quick process. If you've been out of line for many years, it's going to take a little bit, but but the Holy Spirit is going to clean you up because the scripture, Psalm 51, create in me a clean heart. That's what the Holy, job, Holy Spirit's job is, to get that heart clean so that you can easily walk in God's will, in God's way. Hey, thanks so much for tuning in to another episode of At Home with the Word. God, why did you do that? <laughs> I hope you had some fun and got some information. Any questions, feel free to shoot me a comment. On the log, and I want to thank you so much. Until next time, the Minister Fitzhughson saying so long. God bless.